Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me all right? Hello, hello, and welcome to the 11th watch party for the John Vericki uh, Meaning Crisis series. I'm excited to get into this one, but I've got some news before we start. Um, first of all, um, we're going to take a break from doing these until January. It's just everyone's kind of going on holidays, and UV is also due for our baby um, pretty much in a few days now. So that's going to happen anytime, and this is going to get a little harder to manage. Um, what else do I need to say here? Oh, yeah, uh, really exciting news for you guys. Um, if you are in our members um, area, or our community, we are doing a live Q&A with um, John Verveke. And if you're a member of the community, you can come in and join on the video discussion with him and ask him questions. So any of you guys that are already signed up, um, I would start to think about what you want to ask him right now. Um, and that's going to be happening in two days, uh, December 4th. Hey, UV, yeah. where can they find out the information for that? Okay, uh, yeah, all the members will have been sent an email. Um, and I think we'll, we'll figure that out after, actually, um, uh, after we watch the, the watch party thing. And then I'll just announce that before the discussion. So the way this works is... Uh, we'll watch the video together and then we'll jump into a discussion on Zoom. I encourage everyone to join. Um, there's no such thing as stupid questions. Um, in fact, if you feel like you are falling behind or don't know what he's talking about, which happens to all of us, um, it can really help everyone else to get clarity by asking a question and, and trying to get clarity for yourself because we, we generally all kind of share the same types of confusion I've noticed. Uh, UV as well takes show notes every time we do one of these, and you can find those at futurethinkers.org slash meaning crisis notes. Um, that will also be in the little uh, like ticker at the bottom of the screen. You can check that out at any time. And the discussion Zoom link will be given during the intermission. Um, so we'll see you there. Um, anything else? Have I forgotten anything? All right, that's it. Cool. All right, enjoy. Oh yeah, uh, one more thing I forgot. Uh, so I asked in the chat um, if you guys want to see the chat on the screen or not. Um, I can turn that off while we're watching it. So just let me know, I'll take uh, a vote. 
And if you guys want it off, then I'll turn it off. Um, cool. All right, let's get going. Welcome back to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Last time we were discussing the Axial Age uh, within ancient India. And we, were we were focusing in on a pivotal figure of Siddhartha Gautama, uh, the Buddha. And we had been talking about um, his particular story. We talked about the two modes of being um, that were being represented in his story of leaving the palace, the having mode and the being mode. And we talked about modal confusion and about overcoming it. We followed him to uh, the, where he's sitting under the Bodhi tree and he achieves um, a deep kind of realization, a deep state of enlightenment. Along the way, we had discussed um, what mindfulness is, how mindfulness operates through attentional scaling, and how it can increase your cognitive flexibility, your capacity for insight. And then we were trying to draw this all together with some cognitive science, a discussion of what is it uh, to experience enlightenment. Now, I'm not offering right now a complete account or anything uh, like a comprehensive theory of enlightenment. We're going to be slowly working towards that as we move through uh, this lecture series. But I do want to get into and com uh, continue the discussion of these higher states of consciousness. So if you remember, they're very problematic. Uh, but that they're at the core of many of the axial age um, world religions and uh, uh, foundational philosophies. This is the idea that people have an alternative state of consciousness they, that they regard as somehow more real than their everyday uh, st state of consciousness. And that's problematic precisely because we tend to judge realness by how well we get an, uh, an overall coherence in our intelligibility, how we're making sense of things. But in these altered states, that are very different from our everyday consciousness and therefore do not cohere with it, people do the alternative. Instead of rejecting it the way we reject dreaming, for example, because it doesn't cohere with our everyday experience, people reject the everyday experience as illusory and they say that this state of consciousness somehow gives them an improved access to reality. And as you remember, as we've been going through the Axial Age Revolution, and the sense of wisdom and meaning that is attendant upon it, this ability to transcend through illusion and get connected to, to what is more real is central to what wisdom means. And having some deep sense of connectedness to reality is also central to what it is to regard one's life as authentically meaningful in some fashion. So, that was the problem we had set up, the problem of higher states of consciousness. Now I want to start by talking about what it's like uh, to give a theory. We talked about this also uh, last time. We want a theory that's both descriptively adequate and prescriptively adequate. A descriptive theory should tell me, like, give me a good explanation for why these higher states of consciousness have the experiential feel that they have. Why the, and why they're able to produce these deep kinds of transformations. Because if you remember, what typically happens is because people have sensed this deep connectedness to reality, and because being connected to reality is one of fundamental ways in which we make our lives meaningful, people will radically transform their whole lives, their sense of self, their interpersonal relationship, in order to maintain and enhance that connectedness to this deepened reality. So we need to explain, give a descriptively adequate explanation, and this has to work at multiple levels, and this is where cognitive science is so important uh, because of the way it tries to bridge between these various levels and disciplines. We need to give an account of the psychological processes, of the information processes, and ultimately uh, the brain processes that are at work. Then we need a prescriptively adequate theory of higher states of consciousness. We need an account that explains why it might be considered rationally justifiable that these states authorize and legitimate such transformations? Can we see why these states should be listened to when they claim to give us access to a deeper 
reality. Now, in order to carry out the first one, seeing what the Siddhartha was going through, right, when he's achieving this higher state of consciousness, this awakened state, and if you remember last time we talked about how, cons- how comprehensively extended this is, not only qualitatively through the world religions, but just quantitatively through the population, that 30 to 40 percent of people uh, report these awakening experiences and the resulting deep transformation. So, in order to get through that, let's talk about what, what does it feel like to be in such a state. And because we have these surveys and we have the work of Newberg and Taylor, and we have lots of first-person accounts, we can draw some general pictures of what's going on. So there's three components we want to look at. We want to look at how is the world being experienced, how is the self being experienced, and how is the relationship between the world and the self being experienced. So let's start on the world side. So people report the following things. They report um, a tremendous sense of clarity. And this is both perceptual and cognitive. So the world seems extremely clear to them and makes sense to them in a way that it hasn't before. The perceptual part of that clarity is often uh, often experienced as bright. Things are shining. Um, and that's the original meaning of glory, for example. Uh, uh, to go back to the Bible, for example, the term that is most often used to describe God is glory, which is not a moral term. It's a term about how sort of shining um, God is, how, how bright it is. Now, you remember, uh, that's a feature that people also reliably report in the flow experience, that everything seems very vivid and in bright um, and intense. Now, what's interesting is that while people describe this clarity, and notice how this is going to pick up on what we talked about when we talked about mindfulness, they talk about both an expansion of vision, so it's very comprehensive. They get almost like they're somehow aware of the whole of the world, but they also are aware of finite details. So this is captured, for example, in Blake's famous poem, right? To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and to spend eternity in an hour. So you get this deep interpenetration of sort of everything and the finite details. And you can see that. So what you're getting is this massive expansion of that attentional scaling that we talked about mindfulness enhancing, and thereby enhancing our capacity to break frame and make frame and get fundamental insight. And pay attention to the word insight. Seeing into reality. So, overall, there's an increased sense of making sense of things. Right? Making sense of things. So the world is both intricate and interesting in this extended and enhanced and shining way. So almost universally, people describe this experience as the world is beautiful. It's deeply beautiful to them. And we'll come back at some point to talk about the connections between beauty and truth, uh, particularly the work of Skari about this. The world is very alive. It seems very alive during these experiences because it's so pregnant with energy and significance. And all of this, all of this comprehensiveness, but intricate detail, the shining, the beauty, the making sense, all of this comes together in the notion of oneness. There is somehow an underlying oneness to everything. There's deep and profound integration, which of course, makes sense, given that very often when we are explaining something, we are finding what unifies and integrates them together. What's happening on the side of the self? What's happening on the side of the self is people report a profound sense of peace. And this is not peace in an empty, just lack of conflict. It's very similar to what we talked about in Plato. And you're probably seeing Plato's ideas about anagage resonating with this. I hope you're seeing that. But remember in Plato, right, that inner state of peace is one of inner harmony, 
when all of the various components of your personality and your cognition are mutually optimally working together in concert. And this is the kind what people report. They often report that this is the greatest sense of peace they've ever experienced in their life. And if you remember in Plato, this sense of peace, right, is connected to and resonates with this enhanced sense of connectedness to reality. And interestingly enough, that's what we're seeing in these, um, in these descriptions. People also describe uh, experiencing profound joy. Now, of course, we've lost the sense of what this word means. Uh, we've lost it pr precisely in words like enjoyment, where enjoyment means having fun or pleasure. But joy is not the experience of fun or pleasure. Joy is the positive emotion you have when you experience a deep connection to what is good. So joy is the experience you have of this is really, really good. Okay. Interestingly, people often report a fundamental change in their sense of self, and we're going to come back to this. They report two things. They'll often report that their normal sense of self has disappeared, their egocentric, autobiographical sense of self has disappeared, and if you remember, that's, that's continuous with what we saw when people are in the flow state. They report that self-consciousness, that autobiographical narrative self is disappearing. They often also report remembering, in the sense we talked about, when we talked about sati and remembering the being mode, they remember they say, I remember my true self. I remember who I really am. So there's a profound connection inward to the core machinery of the self that is at one with a profound sense of connecting to the underlying pattern that governs and makes intelligible reality. People report that in this state they have a tremendous uh, sense of energy and vitality, again analogous to the flow state. And finally, they report that they're going, they often use this term, there's a tremendous sense of insight and understanding. Again, uh, continuous with the flow state. Now what about the relation? So this is deep connection, profound connectedness. Deep at one again like the flow state, but even more, people feel so at one that they start to feel that they're participating in their reality that they're connected to. They start to feel like they're sharing identity to it. And this you know, way of thinking about this is when we talked about Aristotle's notion of the conformity theory of knowing. They, they feel so deeply conformed to this underlying reality from the very core of their being that they are experiencing an identification with it. But this participatory knowing is so superlative and it's so profound and so transformative that inevitably people just say that the experience, that this connection is ineffable. And we've, we noted this the last time we were talking about. How is it that these experiences that have no right, articulable declarative content, because they're ineffable, you can't put them into words, you can't put them into propositional thought, nevertheless are considered so, so loaded with, so capable of bearing the signature of ultimate reality or realness for people. So we need a descriptive theory that can account for all of these features, the features of how the world is experienced, how the self is experienced, and the relation. Now, what I've been showing you already, of course, is deep continuity with the flow experience. I'm not claiming it's a flow experience. It's more than that. But I'm showing you that there's continuity, just like I showed you that there's continuity between the flow experience and the insight experience. And that's why when people are having these higher states of consciousness, they are also uh, proposing a, a, a very profound insight. And notice how often when you have an insight, it's also ineffable to you. You don't know how the insight arose or what comes, how it came to be. You're just like, ah, I just see it. Now, some other important things we should know about uh, these states. 
These states are often preceded by disruptive strategies. Disruptive strategies. These are strategies that are designed to disrupt your normal cognitive functioning and to alter your state of consciousness. So they can range from very long-term strategies to very short-term strategies. Long-term strategies can be the ones we've already described, like Siddhartha. Siddhartha was engaged for six years in these practices, these mindfulness practices of meditation and contemplation. And they bring about right, a, a, a very long-term, incremental, but nevertheless also profound disruption in your normal state of consciousness and cognition. People also can pursue very short-term disruptive strategies. These include things like fasting, uh, sexual and sleep uh, deprivation. The, if you remember, we talked about how shamans will make use of these strategies in order to induce the shamanic state. There are, uh, they will expose themselves to uh, drumming, chanting, all of these things disrupt your normal level of cognition. And of course, when we talked about this as well, people will make use of psychedelics precisely because of the way they are so deeply disruptive of your normal cognition and your normal state of consciousness. So, what we know is that combinations, well, sorry, that's a little too strong. What we have good some initial good evidence is that combinations of these strategies can be very good. There was a recent experiment coming out of the Griffiths lab in 2018 in which uh, people who were practicing uh, mindfulness and then took psychedelics tended to have a more enhanced experience than people who were just taking the psychedelics, for example. So um, you can combine the strategies together. They can be mutually supportive. Now, what's I important for this, as we'll come back and take a look at more carefully in a few minutes, is disruptive strategies are also central to setting up insight. And that should make sense to you, given what we've talked about. You have to do a lot of breaking a frame before you can open up the possibility of making an entirely new, new frame. There was a recent uh, experiment run by Yadin and Al in 2017. Um, they had... Uh, they has uh, 701 participants. 69% um, of them uh, reported this, what I called ontonormativity, this sense of the enhanced realness of their higher states of consciousness. And this was actually predictive of significant improvement across many dimensions of their life. Right? There was significant improvement in family life, health, sense of purpose, spirituality, and, re and a release from the anxiety and fear of death. So the claim that these states do guide transformation has received um, empirical backing. Now, Yadin also brings out something important in that study that you don't see very well articulated in Newberg and in Taylor. And this is one of the disruptive strategies that, are, are, that people are often using, and it bleeds into the phenomenology, by that I mean the experiential feel and structure of these experiences, right? And this is the notion of decentering. So when people describe these experiences, they shift from, right, a very sort of first person orientation, an egocentric, to an allocentric. So they are not so egocentric. This is why this is called decentering. They're speaking more from like a third person perspective and Right, allocentric. So let me just give you a quick uh, understanding of the difference between these terms. I can describe my motion egocentrically, right? Things that are in front of me, behind me, to the right of me, to the left of me, right? And that, of course, varies by how I'm oriented because it is relative to me. But I can also describe my position allocentrically. I can say where I am relative to the North Pole, for example, right? So. The first is a first-person egocentric way of moving through the world. The second is an allocentric third person. Now extend that out. People are much less egocentrically oriented when they're describing the experience of their state than they are normally. They're much more allocentrically oriented. And that makes sense given how intensified 
the experience of reality is to them. It's like the salience of reality is finally capable of eclipsing the narcissistic glow of our own ego. And for a moment, at least, or for several moments, we get release, right? And this is a, an important idea. Nirvana means to blow out, to extinguish, or the Vedanta term moksha is release. We get a release from, right, the imprisonment, the self-idealization by the super salience, and therefore the bullshitting of our own egocentric perspective. I mean, do you not sometimes wish to be free from the prison cell of the super salience of your own ego? So, as I've been suggesting to you, these higher states of consciousness have a lot of features of insight. I've already talked about the insight. Remember, we did the nine-dot problem, for example, those aha moments. Because you get in that moment of insight, you get a flash of insight, you get sort of super salience, things are making sense to you, you get insight, it's almost visual, into an underlying pattern, a unity, a oneness that wasn't there before. Your sense of what's relevant and important has been altered. And this ability to radically make sense, to find coherence, an underlying intelligible uh, integrative pattern, this we now know from current work is directly predictive of the experience of meaning in life. So Samantha Heinzelman, whose work uh, I, I recommend to you, I also got to meet Samantha uh, in person um, and got to talk to her about this. But what she has is good experimental evidence of the following. If you give people a bunch of scenes that make sense to them, that they can sort of determine an underlying pattern to, and then ask them how meaningful their lives are, they will rate their lives as more meaningful. The act, do you understand? The act of making sense, of finding coherence, actually makes people experience their lives as more meaningful. They're not being shown profound pictures of, or deeply dramatic or narrative scenes or emotionally, they're just showing some, some very basic pictures. But the act of making sense, of finding coherence, elevates the sense of how meaningful their lives are. So, start to put this together. If you were to have an insight that would give you an even more, you know, sudden increase in your sense of meaning in life. And what if it's in flow? Well, it's going to be even more enhanced sense of meaning in life, and we already know that. The more often you have flow experiences, the more meaningful you find your life. And now what if it's beyond that? What if it's a higher state of consciousness that brings you this radical sense of deep intelligibility, not only of the world, but of yourself in both directions? at the same time. Well, that, was going, that is going to give you a profound sense of increased meaning in life. Now, if you get, try to put this together, if you get enhanced meaning in life coupled to an enhanced sense of understanding, and it actually does guide you in improving your life, that is going to build a tremendous amount of confidence in you that you have found a path towards self-transcendence and wisdom. We can start to understand some of the Buddha's confidence. Now, what do we know about these flashes of insight? Well, Tobolinsky and Reber in 2010, this is a different Reber, not the implicit learning Reber, right? Talk about how insight is a fluency spike. Uh, I, I, although it's related to flow, it's not the same thing. Fluency is uh, a gen it's a general property of all of your cognitive processing. So how, how can we understand it? Well, initially people thought that fluency was a, a, a sense of how easy it was to process things. So the basic idea is, if I make it easier for you to process information, 
you will rate that information as better, more trustworthy, more believable, regardless of the actual semantic content. So for example, it, compare this, right, to this, the contrast isn't as great. And if I were to get you to read some te text in black and the exact same text in the orange, you will rate what you read in the black as better, you'll have more confidence in it, more likely to be true. The semantic content is exactly equal. It's because it's easier for you to process the black and white contrast than the orange on white contrast. Now it turns out it's not quite um, ease of processing just because simply repeating a stimulus doesn't trigger this sense of fluency. It's more like how accessible information is, how applicable it is. I would argue that it's how well your system is zeroing in on right, the relevant information. How much has the information be formatted for you so that you can uh, zero in on relevant information. A way of thinking about this to help make sense of it is our discussion of psychotechnologies. Alphabetic literacy made your cognitive processing more fluent and that improved your ability, your, pow your cognitive power, and by improving your cognitive power that gives you an enhanced sense of how real and important the information you're processing is. So the idea here is when you are fluent, you are processing information very efficiently. When you have, according to Tobolinsky and Reber, when you have an insight experience, what you're getting is a sudden spike in fluency. You're getting a, a significant increase in how fluently you're processing, and therefore you start to judge the information that you're processing therein as likely being more real. Now, is this, uh, is this an absolute perfect rule? No. But the fact that it's domain general, the fact that it seems to be part of our evolutionary heritage, and there's also some independent logical argumentation indicating that this fluency heuristic that your brain uses is actually a very good strategy. It's very generally the case, not perfectly, not certainty, but very generally the case that in real world situations, if you are processing them very fluently, you are picking up on the real patterns. So insight is zeroing in. And then we talked about flow as an insight cascade, which is even more zeroing in. And it's, in, it's coupled to implicit learning in which you're picking, remember, you're picking up on bigger patterns that you're not consciously aware of. You can't put them into declarative utterances. Do you see, see what's happening here? So in the higher states of, as you start to move towards the higher states of consciousness, like flow, you're getting this enhanced fluency. So your brain is working very optimally and the implicit uh, learning is picking up on very complex patterns and you're tending to zero in on the causal ones rather than the correlational ones. I'm using all of this machinery we've already discussed. Because as I've mentioned, in the flow state, you're starting to get a lot of the features of the mystical experiences and ultimately those mystical experiences that can be transformative by enhancing meaning in life and your sense of connectedness to realness. You get the at one mint in the flow state, the radical loss of self-consciousness, you're not egocentric, You've, although you know there's tremendous energy, it feels effortless to you, it's graceful, there's a super salience, it's intrinsically rewarding, it's like evolutionarily marked in, it's domain general and universal. All this stuff we've talked about, this is all being triggered in the higher states of consciousness. Okay, so this leads to a hypothesis I want to present to you. Oh, here it is. So um, this hypothesis is a continuity hypothesis. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? We are doing this because we want a scientifically legitimate, a scientifically plausible explanation of what's going on when somebody claims enlightenment. 
like Siddhartha Gautama. When somebody claims radical self-transcendence like Plato. Because we want something that gives a good explanation for what's actually happening and a good justification for why somebody should follow and be guided by these transformative experiences. Okay, so what's the continuity hypothesis? The continuity hypothesis is the idea, so this is a hypothesis I'm giving you, although I, 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 as I was doing research on this, um, Newberg, independently from me, uh, we haven't spoken, uh, has also come up with this, uh, a version of the continuity hypothesis. It's not as developed as the one I'm going to give you, but it's completely consonant with it. So the idea is fluency gets enhanced in insight, insight gets enhanced in flow, right? So you've seen all those arguments already. And then the idea is, as I'm trying to show you, flow experiences can be enhanced into mystical experiences. And then there are mystical experiences that can bring about a transformative experience. These are the higher states of consciousness in which people, right, are willing to transform. We'll come back to the problem of transformative experience. So the continuity hypothesis is basically the same machinery is being used, but it is being exapted. Remember exaptation? It is being progressively exapted into more and more powerful processing that can afford what I'm going to argue a rationally justifiable guidance into the kinds of transformation that we are seeking when we are seeking to cultivate wisdom and enhance meaning in life. When we are seeking to awaken from the meaning crisis, we are trying to invoke one of these awakening experiences. And remember, that's what Buddha means, the awakened one. So, Newberg argues that if you have a lot of these kinds of experiences, what he calls little enlightenment experiences, or regular insights, that this will eventually produce these kinds of experiences. And I, I so this is a, not only a continuity hypothesis, this is a priming hypothesis, and I support that as well. The more you are practicing mindfulness, which we know is predictive of insight and flow, we know that mindfulness practices are predictive of uh, mystical experiences, we know that they're connected to transformative experiences, the more you can prime this pump, the more you will be able to bring about this enhanced connectedness, this enhanced anagoge. All right, so this, I think, idea of the continuity hypothesis will help us to begin to explain what's going on in the higher states of consciousness and eventually use the very same machinery that we talk about in explaining it in, to justify it, to give a rational justification for it. All right. So we know, for example, that in flow, there has to be a relevant expertise. Right? Remember, we've talked about this. The flow state is when your skills, your expertise, right, can meet the demands of the situation. If you don't have the relevant skills, you can't get into the flow state. Right? So I can get into the flow state as a martial artist because I have cultivated the expertise. I can get into the flow state while lecturing, because I've been doing it for 24 years, I have the relevant expertise. So what we might ask, and what you should ask me right now, you say, well, John, like, what's flowing in these higher states of consciousness? What's, what's, what, what expertise are you using? Well, what I want to argue to you is it's a fundamental kind of expertise one that's central to your everyday experience of making sense of the world on a day-to-day -day basis. So this ultimately goes back to work by uh, Marlo Ponti, especially in the book The Phenomenology of Perception, but the people who I'm going to most often refer to, the work of Herbert Dreyfus, Dreyfus is famous within cognitive science for bringing uh, the work of Marlo Ponti and others into cognitive science, and also the work of Dreyfus and Taylor. This is uh, the Charles Taylor that we've already talked about with connection to the Axel Revolution in a book uh, called Retrieving Realism. 
So what process is being optimized here? Okay. So Dreyfus and others talk about right, what they call optimal grip. Now, that's so, I mean, they mean it metaphorically because they're talking about cognition, but that is such a wonderfully felicitous term because, again, it harkens back to the conformity theory of cognition, a contact epistemology that, of course, Charles Taylor uh, introduced us to. Now, what do they mean by that? So part of this is the idea that when we're, let's talk about it first perceptually. When I'm trying to perceive an object, especially if I don't know what the object is initially, I don't remain static. Okay, I'm going to move around the object until I get to a place that gets into a trade-off relationship. Remember we've talked about these trade-off relationships before. What trade-off relationship do I want? Okay, I want to get to a place where I can see as many details of the cup as possible. So that was sort of zooming in, right? Oh, wow. But if I zoom in too much, I lose on the other end. I don't get a, a sense of the gestalt. Remember that? I don't get a sense of the overall thing. So what I do is I move the cup around so that I get a place where I get the best optimization for my needs. It's, all, it's always relative to what I'm doing. I get a best optimization between the overall grasp of the cup, its gestalt, and a grasp of its details. So I'm trying to get a dynamic balance between. That's why when you draw faces, you draw them from the perspective of the optimal grip you have on them. You represent a face in such a way, right? You draw a face in such a way that you try to get as much of the whole and as much as the detail together. You don't draw a face by like drawing someone's eyes really in detail. And you don't draw a face by zooming out, right, too far. You try and get exactly that right balance. So a lot of perception, and you're unaware of this because you learned how to do this when you're like a young child. But think about, for example, again, if you're learning a martial art. Okay? Just as an example. So when you're relearning how to perceive your opponent, part of what you're trying to do is try to get an optimal grip on your opponent. So, right, in Tai Chi, for example, we talk about tiger eyes. We, we, you don't want to hard focus on the person's face. One of the mistakes that many people make going into a confrontation is they hard focus on face or they hard focus on weapon. We know this from psychological research, by the way. You get people who have been held up, you know what they can give you an accurate description of? The gun, not the person who was holding them up because they hard focus, right? They lose that soft vigilance. So what you want to do is you want to get the right, and it takes practice, right? You want to flow over the person. You don't want to be sort of flowing in a blurry fashion. You want to get this sense where you've got a sense of their whole body, right? But you can zero in on details. And then you also are trying to get an optimal grip on your own body. So for example, you're going to take a stance, right? And th the point about the stance, right, is to try and give you an optimal sense Right? Give you an overall sense of, so now I'm aware of my whole body, right? But I'm also aware of it in, in, in connection to the details of where, like where my fingers are, where my wrists are, what my joints are doing. And I'm taking a stance that I can ease, that's multi-apt, I can easily transform it into what I need to do. I get an optimal grip. Okay? You do this cognitively. Eleanor Roche pointed this out in terms of the categories you use. So you will describe things as a cat or a dog. That's how you'll usually talk about it. You usually won't go a level up and say, oh, that's a mammal. So this creature's walking by on the road, and somebody says, hey, look at the mammal. That would be weird, right? Now, they might go down to another level, like there's the cocker spaniel. But generally, they're doing that because they have some intimate familiarity. Most of us would say, hey, look at the dog. Rosh calls this the basic level. Why do we default to the basic level in the way we talk about it? Why is this a table? Why is this a marker? Right? Why do we default to the basic level? Because it's how we get our 
cognitively optimal grip. You see, there's two things I want to trade off in when I'm categorizing things. Here's my category, right? I want as much similarity within the category as I can get, right? But I want as much difference between two categories. And those aren't a trade off. Because as I go higher up, right, I get much more abstract and I lose the specific differences. When I go down here, right, I'm getting too specific. I'm losing the broad generality. We've talked about this before. You're always trying to balance between getting, remember, the higher, the higher states of consciousness, as comprehensive and as detailed as you can. And those are always in a trade-off relationship. So you talk about dogs and cats because that's your way of getting an optimal cognitive grip on the world. Remember we did this? The cat. Remember we talked about how you're simultaneously going up to the gestalt and down to the detail. You're optimally gripping between the gestalt of the word and the features of the letter. And you're doing it right now. You've got a way of paying attention that allows you to read. And you had to practice that optimal gripping. You're going into a first date. What do you do? Well, you're trying to get a sense of the person. Now, uh, uh, here's where the term optimal grip is a little infelicitous, uh, but so don't, don't read anything, um, misread any sexual misconduct into my use of the term. I'm using it in the technical sense. But you're trying to get an optimal grip on the other person. And it's very difficult. Notice how you're, you're toggling your attention and your interaction. And, and you know this because of the kinds of advice your friends give you. They'll say things, right? I, I happen to be straight, so they'll say to me, for example, you know, look into her eyes, but not too much. Smile but not too much. Laugh, not too often. Ask questions, but not too many. And mix it up between these strategies, but not chaotically. And you're like sort of, ugh. And yet, here's the thing. You do it. It works, at least sometimes. You figure out, you find that sweet spot where you're getting the sense of the person, both as a whole and in detail. I'm giving you multiple examples. You're always engaged because you're always trading between these trade-offs. You're always optimally gripping. So you have to do this domain general. You have to do it in every domain. When you're swimming, going on a date, reading, right, looking at an object, you're trying to get an optimal grip. And you have practiced this skill so that you're extremely proficient. You, you do it without realizing it. Herbert Dreyfus is one of his favorite examples. You know how close to stand to somebody. How close should you stand to somebody in order to get an optimal grip on the interaction? There is no algorithm. It's like, always stand four inches. That's ridiculous. Always stand one foot. It depends on the context. It depends on the person. But you have that skill. Most of you are not socially awkward. So here's what I'm proposing to you. What if you didn't, when you, what if you got into a flow state that wasn't, it isn't the flow state of doing a martial art isn't the flow state of playing music, like in jazz or something, what if what you were getting into a flow state about was your ability to optimally grip the world? What if I made it really challenging by altering your state of consciousness, disrupting your normal framing, and then opening up? Because, right, no, remember what's happening in this higher state. You're both opening up your attention and zeroing in to see the world in a grain of sand. What if you were all, what if you had this all optimal grip 
but it wouldn't be on a, just one object. It would be a dynamical, flowing, optimal grip on the world and yourself. The most comprehensive attempt to make sense. Not intellectually, theoretically, but optimally gripping reality. This deep conformity. So what I'm proposing to you is that what's happening in a higher state of consciousness is that people are flowing in their capacity to cognitively, perceptually, and even with the very machinery of their self, get an optimal grip on both the world and themselves. And that's why this relation is experienced as so intensely powerful and so intensely revealing. Now, this would help to make sense of things because, again, if there's a deep continuity between the higher states of consciousness and things like flow and insight, that would help to explain why the disruptive strategies are so important for getting into the higher states of consciousness because disruptive strategies are central, as I mentioned, to insight. You have to bake, break up the bad framing. Now, you can do that by using mindfulness, and breaking frame. You also are naturally disposed to do this. Your mind wanders. Your mind distracts you from your task. And many of us find this annoying. It's like, ah, why can't I keep my mind on something? But why is mind wandering so hardwired into us? And one of my uh, former students, and now colleague and good friend Zach Irving uh, is becoming one of the world experts on mind wandering. I would point you to his work if you want to go into it in depth. What I would want to say for here, and I think Zach would agree with me on this, is that one of the things that mind wandering does is it enhances your capacity for insight. Because by distracting you from how you've framed a situation, it can help you return and break up that fixated frame. And there's work by Siegel and others showing that moderate amounts of distraction actually enhance your cognitive flexibility. The reason why we mind wander, amongst other reasons, I'm not saying it's the sole reason, but one of the things it does is it helps disrupt our framing so that we can break frame and make a new frame. That's often why, and, and, and this is why people have built a whole mythology around incubation. Go and sleep on it, or go for a walk, or take a shower. Basically, what you're doing is a disruptive strategy of distraction. Right? As I mentioned, you can deliberately, more deliberately engage in a disruptive strategy through mindfulness practices. We know experimentally that if you give a person problem and you introduce entropy, noise, into the problem, a moderate amount, that can help them uh, have an insight. And we know, for example, that when your brain is engaging in insight, there's good reason to believe, as I've mentioned, that there's a significant shift, we talked about this, between the left and the right hemisphere. That's an internal disruptive strategy. So your brain has all these strategies, and you can learn some psychotechnologies that enhance all this powerful disruption. So the disruptive machinery that's integral to insight can be exapted and enhanced to bring about a higher state of consciousness. So what, the, what these, all of these disruptive strategies do with insight is what's called de-automatization. So you remember with the nine-dot problem, you automatically, and remember this because we're going to need this when we talk about other things like stoicism, you automatically, unconsciously, saw it as a square. You framed it uh, in terms of the square. You automatically, unconsciously, right, formulated it as a connect the dot the problem. And then that automatic framing blocks you from solving it. And in order to get out of that, you have to de-automatize your cognition. Now, we talked about this when we talked about attentional scaling and mindfulness, just reminding you that What's happening in these disruptive strategies is very significant 
the automatization. Something else is going on with these disruptive strategies. What these disruptive strategies do is they increase the variation in your processing. Often by introducing a lot of noise, right, a lot of entropy into your processing, you're increasing the variation in what you're paying attention to, what processes you're activating in your brain. You're just increasing the variation. Now, why is increasing variation good? Increasing variation is good because what, when, when I increase the variation, what I can do is get more awareness right, of what's invariant. As I, the more I vary what I'm doing, the more I become aware of what's not changing. Right? So as I move around this object, right, lots of stuff is varying, but its shape is remaining constant to me throughout the variation, and that's why I think of the shape as more real, because it's invariant through all this variation. So when I increase the variance, so I pick up, I'm more able to pick up on what's invariant. Now the thing we need to know is that there are two kinds of invariance, two kinds of things that are not changing in your attempts to get a grip on the world. There's good, in, right? There's good invariance and bad invariance. Okay. What's good invariance? By opening up the variation, I pick up on bigger patterns that aren't changing that are real patterns in the world. This is what goes on in deep learning networks, right? You pick up on much more complex patterns of invariance. You get uh, more in contact with what's really going on. Again, think about what you do when you want to make sure what something is. You increase the variation. Not only am I looking at it, I'm looking at it, I'm touching it. I increase the variation to find out what's invariant because if I have increased variation, and I find out what's invariant in it, that often tells me what's more real. That's good, right? So, that can get me real patterns. But there's also bad invariance. Bad invariance, right, is like what's happening in when you're trying to solve the nine dot problem. You keep trying to solve it, and you keep failing to solve it because there's something you need to change that you're not changing. Bad invariants are ways in which you're formulating your problems, framing your experience, that's actually blocking you from solving your problem. So Kaplan and Simon in 1990 talked about a heuristic, a strategy we use called the notice invariance heuristic. This is the idea. Across all of your different problem formulations that are failing, you keep doing this and you keep doing, and I can't get it, I can't get it, I can't get it. When you increase the variation, you can then apply the notice invariance heuristic. What am I not changing in all of these failures? What am I not changing in all of my failed framings? Because very often, what you're not changing is precisely what you need to change. And so the notice invariance heuristic can help you break bad framing that has been causing your failure. Now this, of course, requires humility on your part. This is why the deep connection between wisdom and humility, I would, I would suggest. Paying attention, remembering your failures, such that you can apply this, would be very helpful. Now. Let's talk about, this is one problem they were talking about, Kaplan and Simon. But what if, right, what if I don't just have one error here, but I have a whole system of errors? So very often, when you look at cognitive development, 
right? You take the two-year-old, sorry, four-year-old, because they can count. You count out the five candies. They can count. They know that there's five here and there are five here, but they will reliably choose that row, five candies. Why? Because the amount of space taken up is super salient to them. We've talked about this before. It misleads them. But they don't just make this error with candies. They make this error systematically. They make this error all over the place in many different domains. It is a systematic error. So I can reliably predict that the four-year-old will not only be making this error, they'll be making errors about seriation, about trying to line objects up in terms of increasing height, they'll have difficulties, etc. So it's not just one error, it's an entire system of errors. And the way you go through a developmental change, what kids do, is they find, right, they find a systematic pattern of errors and they find an insight that's not just about one problem, but an insight that will apply systematically to that all of those interconnected, interrelated errors. And when they have that systematically penetrative insight, when they've found that nexus of errors so they can massively intervene on themselves, then they go through a developmental change and they grow up cognitively. They mature. And that is what can be going on in the Enlightenment experience. By opening up the variation massively, you can not only connect to what's more real and feel more connected to the world, remember the world, you can get below the ways in which you are being held back in your own development. You can zero in on the systematic errors and afford a radi radical developmental change. As the adult is to the child, the sage is to the adult. You can go through you can get one of the hallmarks of wisdom, what McGee and Barber called seeing through illusion into what is real. Okay, so we're still not done this discussion because this is pivotal, trying to understand these higher states of consciousness. It's pivotal to understanding the power, the legacy of the actual revolution and therefore what we need to salvage from it. We do not believe in its two-world mythology, but we cannot afford to abandon all of this powerful psychotechnology of interve intervention, of self-transformation, of self-transcendence, of the cultivation of wisdom, and ultimately the deep enhancement of meaning in life by bringing about a developmental harmony within and a powerful conformity and connectedness to the world without. So next time, I want to continue and complete the discussion about the higher states of consciousness. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you guys for joining us for this. So we're just gonna take a break. Let me uh, check how much time that's gonna be. So yeah, we'll take a nine minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do the video chat. If you want to join for the video chat, we'll, we'll still be streaming it here, uh, but you can go to futurethinkers.org slash discuss and that'll forward you to a Discord link. Um, and please do that now. Please join now so I can let you in, so I can have a count of how many people are there and then let you in. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, again, just a reminder, this is the last one we're going to do until the first Monday of January. Um, and as well, um, we're doing the Verveki Q&A session in two days on Wednesday. So uh, come join that one. I think we'll post a link. Okay, Yuvi's going to paste a link for that in the chat. Um, yeah, so yeah, we'll take a few minutes and then we'll be right back for the discussion. So hang around.
Okay, get your microphone there. Okay. All right, I think we're live. Mm hmm. I love that one. Um, I say that every time. <laughs> yeah, they're all good. Um, hmm. You had some really good notes from that one. Uh, what was it? Expertise helps us get into flow. The kind of expertise we use in higher states of consciousness is the expertise of making sense of the world. There's another really optimal good one. grip on reality. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, he talks about that uh, people can practice optimal grip on any skill. Oh, something's not. Is that you looping? Not muted. <laughs> there, it's muted now. Um, yeah, he talks about how people can practice optimal grip on a lot of different things. For example, social interaction, you know, how to be more smooth. Uh, but you can also practice optimal grip on reality itself uh, and your making sense of reality. And uh, that feedback mechanism produces awakening experiences. I'm still here in a loop somewhere. I think it's this computer. We have so many different devices. <laughs> there we yeah. go. <laughs> Jesus. This shouldn't be so complicated. All right. Uh, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Man, I have seen you in so many places, and yet we still have not. I've seen you in so many conferences, and we still haven't really had a chance to chat. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, anyone? Did this stand out for anyone? Um, David, I'm obviously just going to pick on you first. Why do I even bother? <laughs> David, what did you think? I tell you what, I t it, it is, there's so much in this mm -hmm. one. It was, uh, it was just, um, I was, it's amazing because of my, um, my notes are kind of tracking in a, in a different vein than the lecture is. There's stuff that's coming through that's, uh, that's like, oh my God, I didn't realize that was related to what he's talking about now. Um, but the the and I need to go back and read the notes again because there was a reading through the reading through the chat notes, making my own notes, trying to read Yuvi's notes and listen at the same time. There's a lot going on. Um, but the sense that flow, that fluency um, leads to flow, leads to uh, the insight and that and that uh, that awakening. Um, again, I, I'm so struck by the central importance of relevance realization and the stack of knowing, the propositional all the way down to the um, participatory. And um, th I, I had uh, my own little um, insight cascade this past week that feels really relevant with this, that, that we kind of constantly go through these cycles and that we reach some homeostasis where, um, where we're balancing all of that, but kind of uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that we're not aware. So like we, we don't stay in flow. We kind of stay in this homeostatic place uh, where our relevance realization picks out what's salient to us. Um, and then periodically something becomes super salient and tips a cascade that seems to update our knowing in the various levels. Um, and the way that that tips over into higher states of consciousness makes makes me think that that the process of awakening, and, and I see Yuvi caught this in the notes as well, is kind of an ever updating where more real time, I'm, I'm constantly perceiving from all the ways of knowing kind of simultaneously as I'm, as I'm picking out the salience and, and, and doing all of this at, the, at one time. It's, um, it's really astounding how that happens. And, and I'm aware, had an experience that myself this weekend where that kind of all opened up and the intensity of it and the intensity of kind of holding on to that and then it falling away. Um, and so it's really interesting to kind of watch it first person as that was happening. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I, I scatter shot of a, a, bunch, a bunch of different things. I don't know if that helped at all have <laughs> a summary of what this lecture was about, but um, that's the, that's the core of it for me. Mm hmm. And here he talks about insight is a fluency spike. So if you could, if we look at this progression of uh, fluency to insight, to flow, to mystical experience, to transformative experience, to awakening, 
um, then if a person is practiced in fluency, then the spike would produce insight. If they're practiced in flow, then the spike would produce mystical experience. If they're practiced in, you know, personal transformation, then the spike would produce an awakening. So it's like it, it spikes further up, sort of, into more uh, intense looping of that, that feedback cycle. So, which makes sense why most people don't just have spontaneous awakening experience uh, without going through this progression, and why a lot of the time it takes many, many, many years of practice to even get to an awakening experience. Why it's not just like, oh, I'm awake. <laughs> Haven't done anything, but here we go. Well, it's, it's interesting to me, too, because there's something about this. Um, you know, he mentioned early on um, the, the uh, falling in love and kind of that, that super salience that happens when you fall in love, and it, and it occurs to me that the evolutionary machinery that has us pick the optimal mate of all the potential people that we could fall in love with, what are the attributes that do it for us? I mean, it's so interesting that that is a, a narrow focus on, and it's something like um, this ability to perceive the world and filter, you know, look at the signal noise and, and focus and focus and focus and be able to tell very perfectly, what's the one thing that makes the most sense in terms of propagating my genes um, has, has kind of two functions. One is the machinery is common for all of us, and yet my specific expression of that machinery is unique to me. And, and so, that, so that hyper kind of the world and, and, and the individual balancing with each other is kind of constantly expressing through propagation, but not just the, the propagation of the species through myself, but I also then step back and say, this meaning crisis seems to be a, um, a, a species-wide moment of, uh, of, of this flow tipping, where it's like, oh, we're breaking frame and uh, how things have made sense. Um, a species-wide re-updating of our particip participatory knowing. Um, so it's it's like uh, uh, the beauty of the fractal nature of this of the way that evolution unfolds us um, is really exquisite. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting the point about uh, that we have to break frame in order to make new frame. That thinking outside the box is not possible unless we break the previous frame, and so the meaning crisis is exactly this kind of civilization level or at least cultural level breaking of frame. So in that sense, it's necessary. It, the whole thing reminded me too of, or it gave me more context for where trauma work fits in this, in that it's a disruptive strategy, a long-term disruptive strategy, which then increases fluency and then leads down the continuum, depending on you know how you how you progress. Um, but it it really it, it goes to a macro level too, in the sense that as this stuff unfolds, that the 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 practice that so many of us need is that uh that frame breaking of looking at the world through our trauma and and breaking that frame so that we can better see reality and then that opens up that continuum for people There's something about metabolizing that that uh, trauma as well that you know without the emotional uh, attachment to uh, whatever makes you feel better um, in response to that trauma also kind of like narrows you into this this scope of or this like loop of behavior uh, where you you want things to be a certain way you're coping in a certain way and only by breaking the frame that emotional reaction to the trauma can you actually see the world from any other perspective. Like you're talking about breaking the frame of how, how not just breaking the frame of say by dealing with someone's past trauma, but breaking the frame of how one views one's trauma and how one views, how one relates to their trauma mm -hmm. is even a different frame, but yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm reminded of uh, watching, I'm not much of a gamer, I'm kind of older, so I don't play games a lot, but I was ama amazed watching my son when he was six, seven years old playing games and would get to a point of just utter frustration with, uh, with a particular level and like despair, like pulling his hair, just like, ah, and anger. And I was like, just take a break. No, I'm almost there. Uh, the intensity of how much um, how much it wants to break through, um, and it's so it's so so fascinating to watch how that flow process can can get you right there on the edge, and uh, it it looks like um, something like trauma inducing to get to that point of wanting to break frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think um, this is actually really common across many different frame breaking exercises. I mean, even in the, I think it was in the first or second lecture, um, or maybe I'm thinking about a different lecture, uh, either in this series where he talks about shamanism. No, actually it's a different lecture. It's a lecture by Jordan Peterson on shamanism, which is really good. <clears throat> I'll try to find it for you guys in a second. Um, and he talks about an anthropological account of shamanism and how a lot of the time what a shaman is going through is an awakening, but from the outside it looks like psychosis. And, it, you know, the shaman might go off into the forest and, like, rip animals with their teeth and, like, eat their raw flesh or just feed on roots, you know, not talk to people for months. Um, but then when they come back, the real test is, like, can they actually integrate those insights and do they come back as an upgraded individual or do they come back broken? And if they can integrate it and if they become upgraded, then all of that was basically worth it. It was a <laughs> intense frame breaking exercise um, that does look very insane and, and you know, trauma induced maybe at first. But it is that like the integration that's the real test. I, I think that video game example you gave is is an interesting one like there a few days ago i i bought the um the fallen order jedi game and I, it, it's like so difficult and there was this part that i was like okay i need to go to bed now it's like one in the morning or something and i got to this like boss level and three hours later i'm still trying to get through this guy because it was so frustrating and so difficult and you know I think to that point, like there's this middle ground of like knowing there's this achievement that you're on the edge of and then this difficulty and f and recognition that you're in a flow state almost ready to achieve this thing. And, and knowing that if you step away now, you might not be able to get into that flow state again the next time you do it. So there's something about that that creates a really addictive but also potentially incredibly rewarding moment. If you have ever heard uh, a group of 10 year olds play Fortnite, then you have the, the <laughs> definition of flow mm -hmm. and distributed cognition where they help each other all the time. Yeah. Or, or this is each other when, when they do <laughs> things wrong. But it's really amazing. And so, so from the outside, from someone not knowing anything about games, it just looks awful. It's like all they do is staring at screens. But if you listen to it, much is just, you know, stupid talk. But but sometimes it, it's a brilliant way for them, them to collaborate and to get into flow states. And, and you, you, you can almost notice when, when they come into that state. And because and um, John, he, he mentioned the games earlier as flow inducing machines, I think. So it, it's no, no um, chance that, I mean, it's, it's not, um, 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 it's not strange that they are sitting there playing together, I think. And I brought this up in one of the previous calls, but the kind of hyper experience you get from those those collect, especially the collective online games, is just amazing. Like how fast and how many times you repeat the same set of, you repeat different actions within an, an arena that is the same, is just amazing. So you constantly are testing and and building up, and and it's like a one massive three dimensional game of chess that you play with you know, in Fortnite, for example, or Apex Legend, you play it with like 50 other people or 60 other people. And it's this game of chess. It's massively distributed cognition occurring there. And it's so addictive because you it's one of the best and most extreme examples of flow state. It's engineered flow state. I'm intrigued by... Um... 
just uh, just intrigued by that and thinking about um, you know artificial intelligence. They're they're using some of the artificial intelligence game players to start playing some of these massively multiplayer games as well. And um, you know, Go is one thing um, because of the limitation of the board size, but these games are way complex, and computers are still able to to perceive this and, and strategize in ways that humans have trouble keeping up with. Right? It's it's like humans can watch it and realize, wow, it's figuring stuff out that I can't figure out um, in, in, in this complex world. And yet there's something of a very constrained participatory knowing level, right? Um, that the AI doesn't have a real world knowing of it. It's just a very constrained world knowing. It's participatory is, is constrained in a way that's very interesting. It um, There's something in that that makes me think there's that this training of flow um, and the potential of ha actually having more engaged collective flow states with people. I mean, I, I'm, I'm excited by by possibilities there. Um, there's, yeah, Heather, you're going to say something. Yeah, uh, and actually, on relates to that as well. I remember, I think in maybe the when I think it was the flow state lecture, and John Verveke talked about video games, and then he talked about um flows real world flow states as giving a like a different kind of feedback i think because it's you're involved with the real world so that in a video game you're getting feedback but it's 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 a like a um it's like a symbol of the real world right it's not actually real world feedback you're getting and you perceive it that way but it's slightly different so i'm wondering how, like, what, like, wh if you train your flow state outside reality, how does that affect your your flow state? Are you more likely to perceive complex correlational patterns than complex causal patterns? Like, is I, I don't know. Is is there a does it matter? It, does it does translate it matter? to the real world? And and like yeah. he says in in the lectures, it's it's you have flow states and a huge number of different different domains and what a lot of the games are doing is tapping into that mammalian desire to project throw objects and hit objects and it, it's in shooter games or some of the most popular genres it at actually um if depending on how well the game simulates real physics it does translate um and you'll see a lot of military people playing video games in their downtime um, because it actually does translate there's there's kind of both the collaborative skill level of like infiltrating or, or clearing a building and the, the necessary communication involved and then there's the aim which i've noticed if i whenever i've gone to a shooting range or gone to uh pa play paintball it does translate the ability to aim in the game translates but i mean that's a very narrow domain and someone brought up like are there in the chat are there games that people can play that help with particip or participatory what was it gamify awake yeah gamifying awake. awakening that's right i mean i'm sure uh, but that's such a broad like the awakening process is so broad and it's it's kind of like those it's systemic living optimal grip on reality so yeah. the, rea the the game is the game of life because like if you confine it to a game or a specific domain then it's no longer about awakening Right, because it's like it, it's about getting optimal yeah. grip on reality. Yeah. So the the way I would think you could have a lot of use out of that would be in games that play a lot with perception, which I think does somewhat relate to these video games uh, that we're talking about. Like it's playing with your perception of movement, but there's just quite limited and narrow domains that that are being played with. And it's, it is mostly that way because of the entertainment value. If we're bringing it into like heady concepts, you know, you're not going to get critical mass of a gaming market. People aren't going to be buying that game. But as far as group well, practices, um, uh, Jamie Wheel and his Flow Genome Project, they've uh, been researching group practices for facilitating, facilitating flow and transformation. But I don't think they claim <laughs> that they would facilitate group awakening. That would be too big of a claim. I've never seen a practice that does this, and I've never seen evidence of this. It seems a very individual thing. Um, 
But uh, as far as mystical experience, well, ayahuasca is usually taken in groups and it produces a, a group mystical experience which seems to amplify whatever is happening. So there's a beneficial aspect to it being done in a group. It, it is interesting. I am, I'm, I am very curious about um, kind of the inter, interrelationship of these things. I mean, some of the stuff that uh, I was thinking about Jamie Wheel as well, because um, one of the things he talks about is the rotation around at various axes, right? So it's not just the percept, you know, perspectival from different perspectives, but actually physically moving your body around. Um, and that's one of the thing, big things he's doing when training is, is, is movement um, in Tai Chi. And I think that's one of the reasons that Vivek mentions this. But it, it also, there's another piece here that ties in that's really kind of curious to me, which is um, in the comment thread um, during the video, somebody said, oh, you know, be aware. There are also um, awakened psychopaths, right? And, um, and it reminds me of the movie A Beautiful Mind about John Nash. Um, the mathematician who, you know, the Nash equilibrium, um, when he lost his mind and was seeing patterns in newspaper articles and things, it was just really going off the, off the deep end. Um, you know, it was surprising to everyone, surprising to his wife and surprising to his colleagues, how far off the deep end he could go. And, and yet he still had the ability to do mathematics. And one of the colleagues said, how is it possible that you could be so deluded and so intelligent at the same time? And in, in the movie, you know, his, his response was, it comes from the same place. Yeah. You know, it's what Ravicki actually points out, that the machinery, the cognitive machinery that gives insight also can give delusion. It's, yeah. it's very deep. And so your point of integrating that, of learning to come back and, and be able to tell, okay, how can I tell when my mind's bullshitting me? What, what patterns are worth paying attention to? And how do I, how do I tell the framing errors apart, you know, the, the, uh, from each other and, and, uh, discern that. And it's really fascinating to think about the way we do this. The other thing that comes to mind is, um, I, I'm intrigued suddenly by the book. I don't know how many people have read, read Ender's Game. It was popular when I was younger. Um, really, really good book. And again, it's really interesting to look at collective flow states. And, and again, you know, there's something in the imagining, um, them training in a weightless 3D environment with multiple people trying to figure out strategies for how to coordinate physical, you know, physical rotations and different things to attack a species which has a signal, a single consciousness. How can we acquire single consciousness in this flow state that that can combat something? And there's something about that just is like really engaging. Just even reading about the possibility of of, of thinking in that way. We used to think about, we used to play um, Call of Duty Zombies quite a while ago with a business partner. And we used to just talk for hours after playing about what we were learning about each other by playing this really challenging game together. You, you'd face off against hordes of zombies and the number of zombies would increase as you progressed through the game. And then, so we would start off, the three of us as a very cohesive team and you have to like level up and you know get items and stuff but as we got all individually more stressed we all had different coping mechanisms for dealing with that stress and it was we really learned like and, and extrapolated that and discussed it a lot like what we can do to adapt when we find ourselves in stressful situations in the business environment too like we know that mike goes rogue and you know goes off some direction away from the group and UV panics <laughs> and Trent starts blaming everyone in the group. So we, we like recognize that and we actually use that to our advantage a lot in the business discussions after that. I think that that was a really good bridge over to, to and I mentioned this uh, last time we spoke about it. Um, it's one, one thing to reach flow um, privately or together with others outside work. But most of us need to do something <laughs> to, to, to get money for the family and, and, and you know, advance also our minds. So, so I'm also thinking about, I'm glad you mentioned that now, that <clears throat> flow, other experiences can be brought into, like you say, a business mind as well. Because what's spiking in the business world is, is a lot of stress, confusion, cognitive overload. So we need, like you say, coping mechanism to, to, to just handle the, the day. Yeah. 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 
And stress training. You could call it eustress, like when the stress is positive when it actually pushes the person to upgrade themselves and to get better. And video games are a great way to do it because it's, it's fun and you can do it with friends. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, um, in my last job, uh, there were a couple of us who proposed to management that we should go, as a team building exercise, we should go to one of the escape rooms. Um, because one of the things that was really clear is that people were thinking of themselves as a solo um, solver of a problem you know they weren't asking for help and putting somebody in a situation where you're not going to solve this solo you actually have to engage and collaborate and share information and try to figure out in in, in various ways of nope that's not the information i need and 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 it's very fascinating to play one of those games and, and realize um how how dependent y'all are on each other do you remember where this was i think it was in our jamie wheel interview um that he talked about that the most cohesive and effective teams were not necessarily comprised of the best problem solvers individually. And if they tried to pick problem solvers that were really good individually, they actually made a terrible team. It was, there was something about like people being able to go into a group flow state that produced a really effective team. Mm -hmm. And that's what they selected for with Navy SEALs rather than individual superstars. That's like playing World of Warcraft <laughs> in dungeons, really. It's like you all need, I used to be a skeleton priest uh, healer. <laughs> so I always stood in, in the far back, scared of everything, but healing the tanks and asking for, for support when, when the dragons came. So, so, so but, but that, I think we, we can, but one thing that has happened in, in the corporate world is gamification is talked a lot uh, as if that would help us learn more for example but uh, but uh, it's just it's just not working you get small medals if you write 10 emails you know it is like just stupid stuff most mostly so i think that pre people are trying to to uh, take some of the things from games and and other things uh, into the corporate divine but, but it's, yeah, no, it's not <laughs> it's not working we we've used it before with communication and efficiency that's a big one that's like follow how well do we follow instructions to each other um and and kind of communicate up the chain between each other so if one of us is giving a command then how quickly does the other one follow it and and in reverse if if something's wrong how well do we communicate that to the other there's a really good game for practicing this it's called keep talking and nobody explodes oh yeah yeah it's such a good one and it uses, it utilizes so many different skills and types of thinking. It's about solving puzzles, different kinds of puzzles um, on a, a very, very short uh, clock. Because you have a fuse, a, yeah. bomb, a bomb is about to explode. You have a bomb with a bunch of different puzzles in it. And one person can see what's on the bomb and the other person can't. But the other person has the instructions for how to defuse and the first person doesn't. And so it's all about communication and solving puzzles together. You can play it with more than two people, but we've played it with just the two of us. You can play it online too. Maybe we should do that sometime with this group. <laughs> yeah, it's a really fun and geeky and kind of brain stimulating game. Yeah. 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 There's. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I have a lot of experience with the flow as well. And one of the most profound is when I go clubbing and we go into what we call a mosh pit or something like that. We start dancing into each other, but we don't do it. Nobody really gets hurt. And we, it's an interesting experience of how can you be aware of people behind your back without actually dancing into them too hard and stuff like that. So that, that's what I did this week. And then I also play a lot of computer games, board games, and then in different energy states of uh, play uh, something called floorball here that's the indoor hockey where it's very high speed and you have to know where everyone air, uh, is to, uh, to throw a pass to them without actually seeing them so that's lots of interesting aspects of what it is to be in flow especially the one where you are aware of people not, by not even seeing them and that's why um, Jordan uh, Hall and uh, talked a lot about in the Stealing Fire book as well how they screen for that for the Navy SEALs, how you can actually communicate without using words. There's something interesting going on there that we have to explore further as humanity, I think. So. 
You know, I, I suddenly became aware of another collective intelligence phenomenon, which is Twitch streaming. When people are watching others, large amounts of people are watching a single person play video games online. And the chat and the communication and the people's ability to learn and then communicate memes and propagate those memes is massively expanded by the fact that you have thousands of people all watching a single live broadcast at the same time and communicating in that stream format. It's actually amazing how quickly information and memes are transmitted in that kind of setting. And I can't think of any other setting like that's such a the unique broadcast format. I'm, there's there's a um, there's a point here that's kind of interesting, I, I, Patrick. You're you're mentioning that the gamification doesn't work in corporate environments very well. Reminds me, Mike, of something you've said in the past. Um, the reason that y'all stopped being quite so interested in cryptocurrency is because of the gamified version of certain kinds of incentivizing certain kinds of behavior. So badges for number of emails sent is a is a terrible way to make meaning, right? It's it's, it's something like that. It's very easy for this is one of this is kind of a higher level sense making strategy that I think is important for us to recognize is that proper incentivization is very difficult, right? And we're starting to notice that's true in social media as well, right? Like buttons or you know, okay, that's very effective for generating revenue for ads and click click through but very terrible for actually generating mental health and, and actual engagement so um, learning how to self tune and incentivize behavior that actually you know this is this kind of takes me back to the the notion that I had a couple of uh, episodes ago of the game that tries to you know the, the the AI is trying to addict you you know and you're trying to resist that addiction so looking at how do you how do you really in, um, engage in a way that that um, inspires people to, to get in that flow state, become um, super engaged in it? I'm I'm also really aware of uh, I've read and was really intrigued by um, Reality Is Broken, the book by Jane McGonigal, where she talks about the and and there's also a couple of other ones who talk really about gamification, really the deep aspects of game games and um, a lot of what a lot of the aspects of flow that are talked about here are very powerfully illustrated, including that the experience of failure shifts. It suddenly comes from something that I don't, that I avoid. And, like, and, and that's one of the reasons she says reality is broken is that in the world, if I make a mistake, that's a badge of dishonor that I can't, you know, that, that I, I want to hide and I don't want anybody to know about that. But in a, in a, in a game, um, it's just a, an attempt of trying. I, it, it's what is addictive about why you were up till four o'clock in the morning playing something. You know, the, the failure is like continue to drive you on. It, it helps you engage. So there's something really fascinating about how do we, are there ways to gamify the world that are addictive in the right ways that encourage the right kind of collective flow states? Or is that, or, or do we not want to do that? You know, I, I brought up the streaming thing because that's it, it relates to your point when people are when a lot of people are watching one person do a thing or even a group of people. It doesn't really matter. But a lot of people are watching something live and able to communicate with the people who are broadcasting. They spot all their mistakes as well. So it's like there's this instant communication and feedback to like they, they just label it chat. But it's like sometimes thousands of people aggregating their intelligence and and providing feedback for the people broadcasting. And it makes me wonder if, if like doing these types of conversations, if it grew ever, I mean, right now it's only like 30 people watching, but if it grew to this point where lots of people could watch a collective intelligence conversation happening and, and both participate it and, and give real time feedback on it, that might be one kind of interesting new exercise. Then that, there's the, uh, this made me uh, think about breaking frame. I, I remember the first version of Deus Ex, when the uh, game developers were amazed of what people could do that they have, hadn't thought about themselves. They programmed the game and thought everything is fine. But then they started you know, taking grenades and putting them on walls so they can climb over stuff. 
uh, and, and the game developers is like, we, we didn't design this. Yes, you did. <laughs> it's just, a, it, it was hidden. So, so um, um, yeah, I, I would like more, more ways to, to, to uh, skip, the, yeah, skip the whole so-called gamification thing, because so far it's just skip it, don't even, uh, and then focus on more things that, that help us achieve flow states. Uh, also at work in, in big corporations. <laughs> yeah, it's that same problem of um, games uh, can train optimal grip, but in a very narrow way. So that's what gamification does. It's very narrow. It rewards or punishes very, very specific things, whereas life or just getting optimal grip on reality is not like that. It's so multifaceted. There are a million different things happening all the time and the environment is always changing and you're always changing. So it's, that's, I think that's the main difference here is gamification is just super narrow in comparison to reality. So it, it can apply for a short period of time or it can apply in very kind of specific, specific things, things, but it doesn't apply across, across, across the board and, and it doesn't improve people or society overall because it is so narrow yeah and it doesn't really help people at work <clears throat> in that sense because work is far too complex today so even if you just focus on gamification of one narrow subject on that day during that hour then it could be fun but but usually it's kind of meaningless because <laughs> then all the problems complex problems that you don't understand that just rush into you again I think gamification is w w useful for what Mike was saying before, is just training, but not the actual thing itself. So it's like, it's useful in preparation for the thing, but when you go to do the thing, there's no more gamification, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking about this in terms of what I've noticed in the video games that I've played. And I know that whenever there's a new update, like a new character or a new gun or a new whatever, um, that the game developers will spend a huge amount of time right after the, after the initial release to kind of observe and tweak what they're noticing and how people are using these different tools that they've given them because they're, and they're, they're not attempting to incentivize people to do anything necessarily. They just want them to, to keep having fun and keep playing the game. So there's this constant tweaking of balance within the system so that people will return to the system. But as far as gamification that we're talking about with like blockchain, it's it's really a huge amount of effort going into getting people to engage in very specific sets of actions that can be in turn manipulated and, and gamed by the participants. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know, I, I have this feeling that the more narrow the, the set of actions are, Mm, the worse the worse off people are yeah. who are participating yeah there i oh go ahead Heather. go ahead cuz mine's a separate tangent okay okay the the um the, make a note <laughs> yeah the, the sense that um i there's something that has me I uh, want to disagree, Yuvi, and I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I'm on solid ground with the disagreement, but there's something like, I'm, I, I have a friend, I've actually posted about this on one of the, on the Game B thread, that I have a friend who uh, wrote software that actually made the data of what was happening in the organization um, more transparent to everybody in the organization. So, um, where the sales were coming from, how each salesperson was doing, how each department was doing, where the roadblocks were, all of that was tracked in a way that everybody had access to. And the visibility there didn't have a narrow focus of we're going to do this, but it allowed the kind of visibility where people would find, it would, they, they, would, they would develop kind of a collective relevance realization of, oh, here's a bottleneck. You know, and it was in this case, um, it worked in a car dealership and it was recognizing that before the software was installed, sales guys were always promising customers that the service department was going to be able to prep their car within 30 minutes when the service department was like, there's no way we're backed up. And once they realized, oh, this is really upsetting the customers, I can see the I can see the delay there. I can see how unhappy the customers are. There's something about 
actually being able to see that, that the salespeople were like, oh, let me actually check and see. You know, the, it incentivized them to, to optimize for the things that were actually problems rather than optimizing for some manufactured problem. It was like, oh, the actual problems rise to the surface, and that's where the focus goes. Um, and in that way, it sort of is gamified in a natural way um, and not, not in some artificial way of some manager deciding, this is what I want everyone to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very interesting distinction that I'm curious, uh, I'm, I'm curious about how that plays forward. Uh, the, the other part of this that makes, makes me wonder about this is um, some of the other, some of the conversations that uh, John Bravicki, you know, John Bravicki had a recent conversation with Jordan Hall on designing a religion that's not a religion. And there's some talk of incorporating technology in that in order to to map the space. And the comment section was just like there were it, it, it infuriated some people. The thought of of wisdom coming apart from from technology is like, oh my God, you're going down the path of the devil. Don't stop, back up. You know, is really um, adamant. And then there's another one where uh, John Bravaki was talking to someone else. Um, Oh no! It was a rebel wisdom. The rebel wisdom talk about um, consciousness hacking, um, and the same kind of a thing. People just like I, 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 the comment thread was just full of people who were irate at the idea that you can hack consciousness. And um, so there's something we're touching on something here that that, that has a, a visceral response to it. Um, and yet I'm and I'm suspicious that I think I think the the response is not fully grounded. I think there is something here that we're not we're not looking at it deeply enough yet. Right? Yeah, it's, it, I just wanted to comment really quick. Um, there's a difference between the gamification that I'm talking about and what you're talking about. So it seems that what you're talking about is more like bringing things into people's salience that helps them get a better optimal grip on reality. Whereas I'm talking about gamification and in the sense that it's been used in the blockchain space or in the business space, where very specific actions are rewarded or punished. So it's, it's very much uh, engineered rather than presenting information that might help you make better decisions. And I think, yeah, I think that's where the I, difference I would say, is. I would, say, I would say there's some, there's a difference between kind of a mechanical view and an organic view, like treating, treating it as a real life form that is, that, you know, relevance realization is a very complex multi, you know, it's a, this, this thing actually changes, up, kind of, it, it's alive. Um, and mechanical really does look, you know, you create a complicated system rather than a complex system. Um, you know, that, that notion comes up a lot. That was something you were, you talked about on your interview with Nora Bateson. Um, and it's one of the things that's really challenging people, people to get. Um, yeah. I'm, 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 uh, not a gamer, but uh, one of the things that I'm kind of picking up here is that um, but it seems very narrow to talk about that, <clears throat> but it also doesn't seem to to be sort of to honor or, or to um, give value to sort of differences, you know, different, different kinds of skills, different kinds of thinking, different kinds of, you know, bringing, it sort of rewarding a specific set of, of uh, a specific s- skill set and kind of pushing to the top the person who or the people who are able to to sort of perform in that realm and then leaving behind a whole lot of other really valuable stuff that that doesn't necessarily um, doesn't necessarily thrive in that kind of an environment. I'm just curious whether, uh, hey, just, just a thought. Yeah, this was actually very much related to my point about why gamification doesn't work to improve society because it rewards a very narrow uh, band of skills. And, uh, but at the same time, the, the training of getting into flow can be exapted and used in other situations to you know this is this is why i said like uh gaming or gamification can be useful as a training but not when you're actually doing the thing itself 
So, for example, if we go back to the different disruptive strategies that shamans used, um, they used drumming, chanting, psychedelics, sleep deprivation, sex deprivation, fasting, mindfulness practices. Like there's a whole array of different things, right? And getting it good at one of those um, can be used in preparation to break frame and then get an optimal grip on reality. So it's not that sex deprivation by itself is going to bring you to an awakening, but it's, it's going to break frame enough so that you can progress and get more into flow. So I think it's kind of the same with video games. It's just another way to train flow, uh, to train breaking frame, but it's not the well, only it way. It seems counterintuitive to think of it as, as um, preparation, I mean, as games or gaming, because it seems to be designed to narrow. And so I'm having a little bit of a struggle with that concept. It's okay. So it would, the games that I've been mentioning narrow in a very specific way. So it gives you this set of experiences over and over again in height, the most heightened version of those experiences, like the intensity, the speed, the um, mostly the speed that I would say that's the biggest thing. Um, but also it increases variability of what you experience in a very short, intense amount of time. So you would get a ton of experience in this narrow field that allows you to understand a more meta narrative of what's occurring with people who are participating. So it, it's like, I might play these shooter games and it, it's narrow, like you, you might just watch me like sitting there still with my hands on the keyboard and the mouse and, and swearing a lot and getting really frustrated. <laughs> um, but what is actually occurring is that if this, set of experiences were taken out of the context, I would have like thousands of hours accumulated of experience of knowing how people react under stress and knowing what people are going to do when they're pinned to that corner or what type of environment people are, uh, is going to cause certain types of behaviors. So there's this like hyper uh, speed and narrowing of an experience that gives, if you're paying attention and you, you, if you want to be actually a good competitor in these games, you have to pay attention to the meta narrative. That's what it's all about. Um, so it, it's narrowing you so that you might have some overarching vision of, of what's relevant to that experience. It, it's, um, a lot of it is about training attention. So training, training you to uh, narrow and to broaden and narrow and broaden attention, that zooming in and zooming out that John Verveke talked about in one of the previous lectures. And uh, because it's, it's a skill that can be adapted to many different situations, you're just training it in this particular situation and then you can go out and, and adapt mm -hmm. it to something else. It's like, you know, sitting on your ass meditating is not a useful skill for the world. And yet somehow it helps people gain a better optimal grip on reality. It's the same thing. Yeah, S um, Slam Oren in the chat says, how about multitasking leading to decrease in ability to focus? I mean, yeah, there are detriments to all of these things as well. Like the level of frustration that people e experience when something doesn't instantly work is a big part of the problem as well. So if something is not like if the technology doesn't give you what you, you want immediately because you're trained to expect it to work. Like you want to be a human operating at the fastest possible speed you can be operating. You want the only limit of how you interact with technology to be you, not the technology. And so because we're so used to that, we get this incredible level of frustration and like you say, an inability to focus as a result because we just, if that doesn't work, we jump to the next thing. If that doesn't work, we jump to the next thing. Like anytime we have to wait for something in technology, we move to something else. But real life doesn't really reflect that. So I agree there are downsides to this, but like we're, we're learning in this Verveki series, like this is a lot of these things are narrow pieces that are supposed to make up a bigger narrative. And, and mm -hmm. it's up to us to figure out how these narratives all wind together, how these individual skills can actually connect to one another. Yeah, how the different practices link together. Um, it's not about kind of one size fits all solution, which is why the series has, you know, 50 plus lectures and not just one five minute one. The 
the other notion that, I, that comes to mind as we were talking about this is um, the distinction between um, extractive um, a way of interacting and a generative way of interacting so that the gamification for rewarding a specific behavior can be extractive. And, you know, Michael, you had mentioned in the chat as well about money is a bad incentive because it does focus on kind of an extractive mindset, you know, which is the same problem with cryptocurrency. But a generative mindset really is that multivariate kind of ability to think widely. And there's something that seems really beautiful with the ability to zoom out, zoom in, you know, like, um, and, and, then, and then somebody else mentioned too, you know, that the using technology to manipulate consciousness messes with our locus of control. It's like, absolutely, I, and yet it can, in a way, be generative in a way that allows us to um, train our ability to move focus. So it's, um, there's a lot, there's a lot here. Um, seems like we're just kind of scratching the surface on, on how this can possibly be used more mindfully in the, in the world. There's an interesting, again, distinction between using something intermittently and relying on it completely. And it's, it's related to my point about this gamification being useful as an intermittent practice rather than just relying on it to do whatever we need to do in society. Um, and so in, in this case, it's like, if we can use technology to train ourselves to enter a certain state, or if we can use technology to reveal information that wasn't obvious to us before, but we don't completely rely on it, it's, it could still be a positive thing. Because in society, we have many other systems that take away our sovereignty to one degree or another, but they provide convenience or they help us solve problems or you know, they, they can do things that we can't necessarily do on our own. I continue to see this thread of, of like people looking for meaning and for, for um, certainty in certain activities and, and structures in life and, and diving into these things and then having a very difficult ability to step out of it and apply some bigger vision or apply that thing to the bigger world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this whole conversation seems to me to be leading to this point that w we can't necessarily design the ideal systems. We have to design practices or we have to use practices and spread practices that allow individuals to become as sovereign as possible so that they can interact with these systems as narrow and detrimental as they may be, grab the value from it and integrate that value into a greater cohesive whole. And and it's like we all it seems like we always put so much focus on the system itself. The system needs to be altered to prevent the negative behavior or prevent the problems with people. But it's really, to me, like it, this conversation is, keeps leading me back to this idea that we have to focus on the individual and maintaining and, and promoting sovereignty in the individual so that they themselves can jump in and out of any scenario, be more resilient. Yeah, because the, the argument about uh, the how harmful it is to use technology to hack consciousness or whatever, um, it would be the same as an argument for training wheels on a bike for a three-year-old, you know, like as long as it's a training ground and an <laughs> intermediate step, then it's all right. As long as it's clear that there is a point in the future where the kid should be able to ride the bike by himself without training wheels. But then we again come to the problem that we talked about at length in one of the previous calls, which is at what point do we recognize in a society that an individual has a sufficient amount of wisdom to then gain control over their own filters um, or the, the, you know, what they have control uh, of in terms of what would cause them pain? This was a big discussion we had with, um, yeah. I forget her name. Jubilee. Jubilee yeah. It's, it's like, like asking how to, to decide when, when to stop. Um, yeah. Or the training wheels thing is a good one, you know? When do you when does the child decide to take the training wheels off? Well, generally probably wouldn't ever decide that. Most kids probably would keep to it, you know. But the thing is that the training wheels in this, themselves are restrictive, at least if we go with this metaphor. Because the bike with the training wheels doesn't go very fast. It doesn't it's not very 
uh, responsive to turning and a bike without training wheels actually enables you to do more. So there is that incentive to switch to a thing where by having more freedom, you can actually do more. You can go faster, you can turn better, etc. Which amount of peer pressure to, to remove the training wheels. So yeah. there's that. What happens when a society provides negative peer pressure? Keeps telling us that, you know, you've got to keep using the, peer, the, the uh, training wheels. Hmm. Or like we're creating training wheel spaces for people <laughs> spaces. that they never <laughs> leave. <laughs> You know? that, that what you usually is called learned uh, helplessness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You get trained to believe in that you can't, and just because you heard it. So the big yeah. argument I'm I'm really thinking about and struggling with is like, you know, we have in a, with modern technology we have the ability to give anyone and everyone the controls over the filters of their lives, what they expose themselves to, and people naturally choose to expo to optimize for comfort. That's what we always do. I, I find myself unconsciously doing it all the time. And, and yet I have to recognize when that's actually becoming detrimental, when I can't like be comfortable if my temperature is not optimal, my seat isn't fluffed, you know? That's like, <laughs> I, you know, we have to recognize that, but not all of us will do that. And, and society that's... seems to be really optimizing for comfort because we think people are fragile be and it's a cycle too like as we optimize for comfort people become more fragile and it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah it reminds me of those people in wally -E. they're just always in their comfy chairs and they're all super obese and they're just talking to screens mm -hmm. <laughs> i had that exact image pop into my head in this conversation <laughs> i was back to the <laughs> That relates actually to a comment quite a while ago in the chat, I can't remember who said it, that a lot of people are really resistant to frame breaking. And it's, it's exactly that, it's just more comfortable. And it makes sense because for a brain, it's actually um, a resource intensive to break frame. It's costly. It actually, uh, you know, knocks you out of balance for a while and, and, it, and it costs more. Yeah. Even painful, painful yeah. kind of frames because it's pain that you know, yeah. you recognize it, you're familiar with it. So the question is, like, it, it kind of funny, funnily enough, it comes back to like um, rites of passage. Like there needs to be a transition point where people, where society looks at the individual and goes, you, you have done it. You are an adult. You Time know? to push you out Here's the, the master control switch. But even then, it's <laughs> it's still that should be released in stages i think throughout yeah. life mm -hmm. but uh, yeah so i'm curious here's a here's a notion i, I want to throw this out as an idea I, it's another game idea in a way um, um so the idea is something like um if we open up um to a smaller community of people the full range of what we're doing and how we're impacted by what we're doing and noticing the kinds of meta direction that we want to go in. Are we, are we, you know, if I can see what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and, and notice, not necessarily just watching you, but you know that I'm watching you and the benefit of that is, oh, it looks like you're choosing comfort here, you know, and it's like, is this, you know, do you really want to choose comfort here? You know, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to eat that pie or whatever. Um, I, you know, there's a, I have a particular way that I can think about implementing this that um, that requires radical transparency, but awareness of that radical transparency. Like you know when I'm looking at you, you you know what my analysis is. I, I know how you you're, what you're looking at me when you're looking at me. So there's a there's a massive reflection, but also kind of a a collective relevance realization of what is important. Is am I is that incentive is, it, is that incentive pushing you to be too risky or too comfortable can we tell you know over the short range and over the long range um and I, I i'm curious about that but there's something about that that feels like how could that be what what are the potential unintended consequences of being able to see to, to switch over to a more um, transparent view rather than a private view there is I know a, my own internal sense is, is uncomfortable, but but is there something beyond uncomfortable that actually makes that un, undesirable? 
Yeah, I actually wanted to bring up something from Peter Lindbergh's article on, on the meme tribes. And that was one of the six crises that he talks about. Um, I can't remember exactly what he called it, but he, one of the, the descriptions was the pornification of people's lives. So where we are oversharing, everything is out in the open, you know, all of our lives, like to the point of people actually vlogging their whole lives and showing the internet what they're doing. And it actually seriously impacts people's psychological well-being most of the time. And it, it seems to be more negative than positive. It, people need some sort of privacy for mental health. Obviously, we need social feedback as well, but there seems to be a balance. And um, his point was that now we've overshot the balance in the other way. Like there's just too much transparency. There's too much sharing. We're watching each other and calling each other out too much. It would have to be out of a spirit of like, I want you to see me to call me out on my shit. <laughs> it can't be of like this performative element that that is what this broadcast. But it does become performative all about. because well, that's it's what I'm easier, saying. you know? Yeah. And I'm saying well, another point to that is like p if because there's this unconscious desire to be perceived a certain way, people are going to optimize their performance as well. And I see that a lot, like yeah. where someone at the end, the beginning of a vlog channel is like very mm, genuine and, and shows a window into their lives. And then as time goes on, they become more and more performative. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a, a part of my inspiration for thinking of this, I think, comes from my long term circling practice. Um, it's something that I've been aware of in circling. Uh, and it's it's interesting here, too. I'm aware of, you know, the desire to speak so that I can be seen as intelligent versus just wanting something to share versus holding back and letting other people speak. There's a real interesting notion of um, what part of this is performative and which part of it is, you know, Am I looking for rewards or am I actually participating? Um, it's a it's a challenge to feel into that. It feels like it's a growth edge. And I think that there is something that's right about that that done prematurely, it's almost almost purely on the on the badge seeking, the the um, you know, the, along the lines of something like um value or um, virtue signaling, right? Yeah. Or 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 voyeuristic or you know different ways in which that that can be problematic but it does seem like there's a there's a level of maturity where you can get to where you could be i mean like the the gamers right when the twitch gamers are massively watched for that it it doesn't damage their psyche to be watched in that way or i don't know I, and it's a good question I'd it be does curious, actually well, no, no, no. some people <laughs> can can handle it but i mean it depends because there's all types of different streams some people are meant mm -hmm. to are there to be the highest skilled most competitive people mm -hmm. and the the stream they just have to ignore and, and intermittently jump back in right in and out of the stream but when people are based on their performance of just life kind of very broadly that seems to be damaging but this relates all back to the flow state thing and like you know david what you're saying about your self-awareness so you've always got that that kind of inter you're always internally watching and then wondering like okay how am i behaving correctly in this situation or or like looking for that kind of intention behind the the impulse to do something right and i'm wondering if I'm wondering how to articulate actually what it is that making some sort of goal like truth or or excitement or curiosity, uh, the goal that you you optimize flow state around, if self check-in is not even as necessary if you're able to do that a lot. You know what I mean? Like if if it's not so much about the performance or the um, uh, I, I, I could just say performance, yeah. Like desiring to be seen a certain way. If, if you can somehow isolate and delete that property of your personality and then just make the conversation about what it is that's exciting or interesting or, or, or valuable, if, it, if that self-check-in thing is not... I'm only saying that because I'm describing something I'm, I've never really described before, which is like, when I'm having the best conversations, it's it that seems to be what's what I'm how I'm operating. And like I find I, I realize later I'm 
not checking in very often. It sounds actually... like play, playing jazz, right? Yeah. But I mean, you yeah. can't, yeah, that's right. And, and, and like anything, like a good conversation or, or playing games or playing jazz, it's like you actually suck the more you're doing that kind of like self analysis. Like if you, it takes you out of flow state, you know? Yeah. It's, it reminds me of when I'm singing and you're like, Yugi, you're performing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can tell when I'm like kind of analyzing how, how well I'm singing. And if I just, completely like don't hear myself and just focus on, yeah. on doing it, then it's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> There's something, David, when you were talking that um, kept making me think, and then Mike and you, you were saying about transparency and in the internet and performative, uh, you know, the effects of that on people. And I think there's, the problem is we're trying to recreate something in our current world that we've lost, which is community. And I feel like community just naturally, like if you're in a community of 150 people hunting and gathering, you're all keeping each other in line. Like that's yeah. just how it works. And yeah. everyone knows what you're doing and you know what everyone else is doing. And then we haven't had that for thousands of years. And so here we are like reaching for it through the internet with strangers and destroying ourselves. And somehow we need to like, we can't go back, but we need to sort of integrate, I guess, the two things somehow, like to to recreate at least a sense of community that helps us, that, that has that trust. And then we don't have to perform and we can be transparent with those people. Yeah, I think it has to be physical. I mean, there has to be some part of it that's physical connection face to face. I mean, this person's a great cook and she's magical with her in the kitchen. This guy is good at gaming. I mean, it has to be some way of pulling all that together, you know, in the modern now. A big part of the, the hunter gatherer tribes is that they relied on each other for survival. So they actually needed each other. They were invested, deeply invested in each other for life which is not the case on the internet at all and not a, a, the case in a capitalist society where you can just go and buy whatever kind of product and service you want. You're not actually deeply reliant on anyone, really. In gaming, you are. Hmm. But, it, but at the same time, the cost of losing, you don't die. You can just try Depending it. on how seriously you take it, that's, that's a value <laughs> judgment. Some people just lose I their know, minds. I <laughs> I feel pretty, pretty. Uh, I think it's pretty urgent that we that we do. I mean, I have a real sense that this is a crisis that is is a huge amount of urgency. Maybe not, you know, 150, 100 gatherers who are going to die from being attacked by bear. But there's a there's really a, I I feel a real sense of, of uh, fear. I guess. I think I do. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And I think that on a global level, we have this illusion of independence and being able to just take care of ourselves. And, you know, we think that the store is always going to be there with its million products. Um, but, you know, having lived through the collapse of Soviet Union, that is not the case. Sometimes a time can come when you go to a store and there's literally nothing. And then you're like, OK, well, now what? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think we're a lot more reliant on each other globally than we realize and interdependent, interconnected. One of the, uh, one of the games that are the kinds of games that, uh, Jane McGonagall mentioned in reality is broken is alternate reality games. Um, and one of them was like the end of oil, um, where people actually live in such a way as to pretend that we're out of oil. And so they're not able to, you know, they have to walk or bicycle or whatever. And so there's a way that they're engaged to that, um, that is like gives them the experience of, of living that way um, and interacting with people. But, um, you know, it's, it's partially, it, it kind of bridges that gap of somewhat online, somewhat in person and real, real world impact um, that um, kind of puts a game overlay on top of real life in a way that has you 
experience it differently. It, it's a it's an interesting way to break brain. That's really cool, actually. I'd love to. What was the name of the book again? Reality is Broken. Reality is Broken. Cool. It's worthwhile. It's a good book. I'm curious to know what you guys think is is missing in conversations like these like you know we talked about how there's not or john brought up there there there's a missing element of that in-person thing what is it that if the goal is to have like interrelational kind of cognitive operating system upgrades like a circling practice or like this this face-to-face -face interaction where we're all kind of watching each other and and stepping up our, our each other's operating systems what is missing in this I suppose if the, that's the goal, like to me, it seems to be working. What, but what would, what is missing that would be even better if we were doing this all in person, if we were all in the same room? I know it's an, there are some obvious answers to that. It's kind of a dumb question, but just want to hear it from you guys. I feel like maybe it's a level, it's not even necessarily in person. It's just that if you're able to meet in person, you probably live in the same place and therefore you can see each other on an ongoing basis. And so it's a, it's a continuity of relationship, I think, mm -hmm. is one big part of it. Oh, that reminds me of that experiment. Do you remember that little web experiment? Is like when it's, um, it's not just about kind of the game, game theoretic environment in one game, it, it has to do across many games. Remember that little simulation? And it's like depending on what oh, kind yeah. of style of game you play. Yeah, uh, it David has brought that up. Consequences. Uh, the more games you play. It's a game theory. Yeah. I can't remember what the link it's is for that. There's David, like a little uh, web game with those simple the, illustrations. The, was that the evolution of trust? Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, um, I, I love that. There is, there is something um, very teaching about taking you through different contexts in order to demonstrate something. So it's a little bit of graphic, a little bit of interaction. There's some participatory part of it. And then the insight is given, and, you, and it's like, oh, wow, in 30 minutes, a very, it's a, it's, it, that's an actually, actually a really good example of doing something that's not just propositional. If you try to just propositionally tell somebody, what that trust is, it doesn't work nearly as well as that participatory part of going through and, and perspectively shifting and, and, you know, getting the procedural knowledge of how that, how each one of those little games works is really fascinating. I, I like that as a, a model. Mm. There's, there's also something interesting here as well. I noticed because we, because we're circling a lot here in Austin and I've also done some improv classes and a few other things and the community is, uh, intermixed enough that we know each other not you know it's a different group of people but we recognize each other or have um, more than just acquaintance you know but not quite friends but then i uh, this past or a couple of weeks ago went out camping and one of the things that was really fascinating is sitting around the campfire we all had this feeling of my god this is a really primal activity and it was somehow it felt more salient that this is meaningful to us sitting around a fire under the stars telling stories it was like whoa we're this is i don't remember ever having i mean i've been around campfires before but this feels different somehow um like there was an extra extra layer to it that was um that was interesting yeah that reminded me actually we were we went to this natural building workshop a couple months ago where um we were building a house out of locally available materials so just you know mud rocks chunks of wood that were harvested just like in the next village and um there, it was it had the same feeling there was something just so satisfying about it on a very primal level just like putting mud on the walls i i can't describe it there's just like my monkey just felt so much joy <laughs> that's the kind of game i like mm. <laughs> building something but, but it's um, it, the answer to Mike's question about, I don't think there's any, I think that you're, this is contributing to, I mean, it's sort of one part of what's needed. 
I don't know that bringing something different necessarily into this this group or this method is what's needed, but it's I think what's needed is this and the fire. And I mean, it, you know, it, it's a combination of things that that need to be done. Or, uh, and I guess the, 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 the thing is that this group of people can can converse at a certain level that is not available at the campfire. I mean, I go to the campfire and it's different. It's a different group, and it's a, and so that. We there, can take this as a video game again. This is the training ground. Yeah, you know, it's a hyper. Yeah. This is a simulation. We are just here discussing some stuff, and then hopefully it has some sort of a produces some sort of connections or aha moments or whatever, and then people go and apply it in their real lives, and hopefully upgrade their optimal grip on their own reality. You know, I I thought about it myself. Uh, is uh, after I asked that question, what I think is missing, and a big one for me would be. The, what we've already covered a lot, which is that performative aspect of the conversation where it's not necessarily like we're all trying to appear a certain way. I think we've talked for long enough that we're, we're just the conversations, the priority. It's not necessarily for all of us that we're strongly trying to appear a certain way, but also we're not, we're not interacting as if we're not being watched or if, as if we're a roommate with someone like we've, we're doing something. And I think there's a lot of value in that, in, especially with like the goal of what we're doing with these calls, it, which is like self-understanding and behavior change and these kind of things. There's something about watching someone, a group, like the group dynamic, watching someone do something when the group isn't their goal, when they're like washing dishes or interacting with their kids or like talking on the phone like there's something about that that other goal that people are able to witness um that is super useful that i'm i'm realizing can't be done in a call like this it's like we're all we're all pointed at our screens and our webcams there's nothing i'm not going to go like you know talk to my mom on the phone now and all you guys are going to watch or something and see how i interact with my mom like mm -hmm. you know yeah the, the separate Everybody is separate context. We're mm -hmm. all in different contexts that we don't really. I can't see it through the screen. Yeah, <clears throat> and and that I think is what I'd like more. Of. I'd like to have more of that. Mm -hmm. okay. Should we wrap up yeah. on that note? Yeah. <laughs> You'd be sitting on the bouncy ball. I can't sit. Can't sit in chairs anymore. I'm too pregnant for life. And that farting sound is not her farting either. It's the ball. It's the ball. <laughs> At least most of them are the ball anyway. <laughs> All right, guys. It's a great way to conceal farts. <laughs> All right. Uh, see ya. Uh, concept. That's some concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. On that All right, so note. All right, so yeah, sure. We'll see you on Wednesday for for me and you. But uh, for the calls, it's picking up the first Monday in January. You said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless it's like yeah. January first to third, then it's too early. Then it'll be yeah. the second Monday. So it'll be somewhere around like tenth, fifteenth of January, probably. We'll restart. Well, that's okay. Let's find out for sure then. Yeah, actually, let's look at the calendar. Then. Yeah, I think it's actually the first is a Thursday. I think. So. That would be um, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. First so it would be Monday, the Monday. So Monday 6th, January 6th. Should it be the 6th or the 13th? The 6th, I think, is okay. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's re. So that's a month break. Uh, mm -hmm. More than a month break. Do yeah. we want to do like maybe one or two in between? I won't be able to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say let's plan on let's plan on taking a break. I mean, it's coming up holidays and people are going to be traveling and stuff. But uh, yeah, I think yeah. I think it's probably a break is, is a good thing. Yeah, and then it gives everyone a chance to catch up too, because not everyone can come to every yeah. one of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. So we'll reconvene then on the sixth. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thank you guys for joining All in right. discussing. Happy holidays. All right. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Too. All right. Uh, thank you. Mm, bye bye. Bye. Bye.